welcome. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ro. I am a survivor of narcissistic abuse. I was in an abusive relationship for 14 years with one guy and um, another long ass time with another guy. <laughs> Nine months. How are you, Savannah? How's it going? Hey, Ro, what's up, Elle? How's it going? Welcome, welcome, welcome. <sighs> Come in and say hi. Tell me where you're from. What's going on? Um, we're just chatting about narcissistic abuse. Again, my, my name is Ro. I'm a certified life coach and I help people heal from narcissistic abuse. I help people heal and move forward in their life and start dating again if they want to. Oh, thank you for the rose, Tommy. What's going on, my friend? It's been a minute. Miss your face. Um, West Coast Fits. Where are you from? Huntington Beach. Nice. Hi from Colorado. Hello. I'm in Canada, if you don't know. If anybody doesn't know where I'm from, I currently live in Canada. I actually was born and raised here in this city. Pretty cool city. Um, hi from Canada. Me too. I'm in Canada too. So yeah, pop your questions. I, there is, there isn't really a place to put questions in. Um, you might be able to, you might be able to actually, I don't know if you can, but if you have a question, pop it in the chat and we can answer. We're talking all about narcissistic abuse. Hey, you miss your face. Don't do lives often. I can't figure out the messages. I don't see a lot. Yeah, I haven't seen you live in a hot minute too. And actually I was on vacation with Carrie McAvoy, PhD. I had a really lovely vacation in Mexico with her and uh, for her birthday. And so since I got back, I've just been kind of working on um, content and doing some things for me. So I haven't really had a chance to go live very much. Um, how do you get over a trauma bond? Yeah, a trauma bond is something that is developed when we're in this abusive relationship and we're addicted to the person who's abusing us. Thank you for the follow. Um, and having a bond to this abuser, having a this bond where you feel like you're so connected to somebody and you're trauma bonded, you're actually addicted to the trauma because that is what you got used to. You got so used to it. Um, you can ask questions here. Oh, perfect. Uh, so I would say getting over a trauma bond isn't something that's really possible. Recovering from it is. Um, having the trauma bond and breaking it isn't something, it's, it's never going to go away. It's something that we're healing through all the time, working through all the time. So one thing you can do, I have links in my bio. You can work with me, a coach that gives you one-on-one -on -one coaching on how to work through this trauma bond, but you can also recover from your trauma bond doing specific techniques. There is a trauma bond recovery course that is linked in my bio. Um, along with a workbook and journal that you can work through some of that. Um, written by Lisa Sani, Stronger Than Before. She has made an amazing course that is a 12-week course. And every week opens up the next part of the course. So if you, if you finish you know, one week, you can't actually open week two until week two. And this is why it takes a long time to... It, you know, you have to be able to like take a break in between so that you can actually... Um, take time to recover from that trauma bond. Speeding through it like that and having it done so fast isn't going to help you really connect with journaling and, and working through the issues. So doing this, I'm so excited. Hey, babe. Hello. How's it going? Hi, everyone. So yeah, working through the trauma bond. Check the um, link in my bio under resources. You can see how to break a trauma bond or how to recover from a trauma bond. There is a um, and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, decline. I don't know who you are. Sorry. Let's see. What do we have here? Um, <laughs> why do blo narcs block after narcs? What do you mean block after narcs? Can you explain that a little bit? Narcissists will block. If you're asking if they block, okay, then unblock. Okay, yeah. So why do narcs? narcissists block and then unblock they do this to get your attention if you actually want to block somebody you're doing that as a boundary blocking is a boundary so having somebody in your life that is toxic or that you don't want them to suck the energy out of you or you don't want them to um 
you know, you're, they're bothering in you some way and they're, they're affecting your peace, you will block them, right? That's a boundary. You no longer want them in your existence. You don't want them around. So you block them. A narcissist will block you to prove a point. They'll block you. They want you to know that they've blocked you. Personally, if somebody blocks me, I don't even know half the people who block me, honestly. If they block me for whatever reason, that's fine. They can block me, and I'm not affected by it because that is a boundary for them. I'm actually proud of someone who blocks me. A narcissist will block somebody in order for you to get a reaction and then unblock you to see what your reaction is. They don't want... You don't want them to disrupt your peace. Absolutely. 100%. And I love that little love badge there, babe. See that little love badge, guys? If you want to subscribe to my live, go hit the subscription button and be subscribed in. You can actually get access to specific little emotes. They call them emotes that you can pop in the chat. And also you, um, there's one right there. There's me. There's a little emote. See it? It's cute, right? Isn't that cute? And then I'm also going to be doing chats where I will only be answering questions to people who are coming in um, as a subscriber. They'll be, you'll only be able to chat if you are a subscriber. Oh, thank you, Matthew. A little bit out of context, but I appreciate you for the compliment. Fellow Canadian as well. Um, why does a narc love having the attention and power? Narcs love being in power and control. They love it. It's one of their favorite things. I think the reason why is because they really don't have a lot of control in their own life. This is my theory. They don't have a lot of control over their emotions. They don't know how to regulate emotions. They don't know how to get to this place of even just being in control of their their purpose, their journey, their path. So they will put all of that on others and control them. So if you've ever had a narcissist, hands up if you've ever had a narcissist try to control your finances, control the people you talk to, control their the access you have to your own friends and family to people who like they even control your job they don't want you working at this place that place the other the amount of times you go to the gym the amount of time what you eat the narcissist in my life he controlled what i ate he was like you can't have that that makes you happy you like sushi you can't have sushi you know i'm gonna control you they do this because they can't control their own life so they have to control you they love having attention and control because they don't have a lot of self-esteem they don't have a lot of control over their own emotions and lives, so they have to control you. Um, common to refer to them as alpha males? What do you mean? I don't know. I'm not sure what that question means. Hi, love. You're awesome. Hey, Kelsey. What's up, girl? KP. Guys, you got to go follow my friend KP. She's amazing. Some of her skits, I'm telling you, some of those skits. She's got some amazing skits and relationship goals. If you want some relationship goals right here, uh, she's relation hashtag relationship goals. Hi. Yup. 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 Am I in your ear? Am I too loud? <laughs> oh my gosh. You're so sweet. Yeah. Your mod mod status. Mod status. We got all the narc Avengers up in this. Every anyone who knows the hashtag narc Avengers, feel free to use that. It's we're part of a community of creators, people who are coaches, therapists, self-aware narcissists, people in this space who are educating about healthy relationships, how to get away from toxic relationships, how to identify a toxic relationship or a toxic dynamic. And um, the Narc Avengers right now, there's 16 of us and we're all spreading the word of narcissistic abuse and what it looks like and how to get unstuck if you're stuck, how to move forward in healing and have healthy relationships. This is a really great space to be in. If you're feeling like you're putting content out and you want to spread some awareness, use that hashtag Narc Avengers and um, be a part of this community. I'm stuck in a marriage with a narcissist husband because I can't be away from my sick child. Need strategies to learn to live with him for now. Yeah, that's harm reduction. What you're describing there is harm reduction. That's okay. If you're not ready to leave a narcissistic relationship, you're not ready to escape and have an exit strategy, you can plan to leave this person. But planning it is one thing. You still have to live with them, right? Especially if you're in the, in, in a space where your child might be 
um, needing extra support from you and you can't really disrupt the dynamic by leaving right away, we can't just leave. You know when people say to us, well, you're in a narcissistic relationship, you're in an abusive relationship, just leave. We can't just leave. Like sometimes it's not possible. So what do we do when we have to stay? We do what's called harm reduction. Ooh, we got one crown, guys. We got one of 20 crowns. One of 20 crowns. Thank you, Christy Michelle. So if you are stuck in this space and you cannot leave right away and you want to plan to leave and have an escape plan, an exit strategy, I can help you with that. One, I am a certified life coach that helps people leave these abusive relationships, helps identify. But another thing that we want to look at is harm reduction. How do you reduce the harm in your household, right? How do you keep the peace? There's low contact even if you're living with someone where you don't have to communicate with them all the time daily giving them the play-by-play or feeding into the drama or reacting to the abuse what you can do instead is learn the tactics that they're doing to you and learn how to cope with them so if you think you're being gaslit by a narcissist in your home you can remember some of these things four things to remember if they said it Okay, if you, if you heard it, they definitely said it. Whatever you heard, they said. Don't let them make you feel crazy by saying, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay. If you see it, they did it. So whatever you see, they did it. One thing you can do is you can journal. and You can start writing some of this shit down so that you know what it is you're seeing and what it is you're hearing so that you are not getting gaslit. Another thing to remember is when they tell you it's just a joke, it is hurting you. It's not a joke. So be good with your truth. And just remember, you're not crazy. So that's part of harm reduction. Another thing is to understand what the silent treatment is. So if they're trying to do this on you, you don't have to worry about, um, you know that it's a punishment and you're not sitting there trying to to break that silent treatment. You know they're doing this to punish you. Um, If I end things with him, I can't afford the rent on my own. I was a single mom before I met him. My daughter's father used to hit me and I moved on with this guy. He's treating me so well. Michael, or is it Michelle? Michaela? Michaela? Michaela Faye. Hi. So that's a, that's a pretty difficult situation that you're in. I mean, this would be a coaching session. I think that if you wanted to book a coaching session with me, I can really dig into whatever it is you're going through, kind of look into the things that you're dealing with and give you some clarity on on things to move forward because it sounds as if um there's some physical abuse that you're kind of going through as well do narcissists love bomb early in the relationship yes absolutely they 100 percent love bomb in the early parts of the relationship love bombing is a manipulation love bombing isn't getting to know you long term it's getting to know you as quickly as possible, right? Not investing in you in the long term. They're just trying to get to know you as quickly as possible. Uh, And that's manipulation. They're doing this to gain your trust. Thank you. I do need to work on not having such emotional reaction to everything which he wants. Yeah, that's, that is harm reduction because that reactive abuse happens like that, right? Any signs to know if it's love bombing or real love? Real love, by the way, First of all, love bombing is toxic as hell, okay? Toxic is all fuck. So if someone's love bombing you, right, the red flags would be too soon, too quick, telling you that they're your soulmate, telling you that they are, you know, you were destined to meet them, all sorts of shit like that. If you're being love bombed, that's manipulation, that's toxic. Nothing toxic ever comes from real, true love. Nothing toxic ever comes from real, true love. So is it love bombing or real love, right? They're completely on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So what you want to do is you want to look at the things in a real relationship where love is built, not just bombed on you. It has to be built. So it will take time. If they tell you they love you on the first date, that's manipulation. If they say, I think I'm in love with you. I don't know what it is. It's just a feeling. I think I feel it. Why? Why do you love me, right? Like, what does that mean? Love is a verb. It's done by actions. It's not just words we say. Love is a verb. It's how we show it. 
My ex is sabotaging. He's been on a downward spiral for a year. He's not paying any child support while under child support enforcement. Ooh, that's not good. How's it going, Amy? How's it going, guys? I uh, we got a we got a goal. We got some crowns here to give to to. We got forty minutes on the live, so if you guys want to send me a little crown, I got this little goal here. I don't know what it means, but hey, we're doing it. My ex said she loved me less than a month. We're engaged and broke up. She loved someone three days after. See what kind of let see? Do you see the lesson, right? Good for the most part, yeah. Hey everyone, what up? What's going on? Just found out mine's making multiple Instagram accounts to check on me. <sighs> LOL. So that's LOL. So is it Sienna? Okay, we can laugh at this because we know that this is the kind of shit that they do, right? You get to see my goals. See, I didn't get. I don't. I don't get to see your goals. I don't know what's up. What's up with that? Um, he even emailed me, right? We have to remember, though, that this can be really terrifying for some people as well. I can laugh at it because I know how ridiculous. Like, I'm at a place where I can look at my ex now and just kind of laugh at him and go, what a tool. That the guy's a tool. But there are some people who are really, 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 um, they feel of a deep violation when somebody's making fake accounts just to look at your account. You've blocked them and they're still looking. They're watching your every move. You're being monitored. You're being watched. You're being surveillanced. That kind of shit is violating, right? It's terrifying. And we can laugh at that even though we know how dangerous it is. Stalking behavior is really dangerous. Um, so it's something to think about. This is how a narcissist deals with their injury. If you leave them or you move on or you're, you're happier, they get a narcissistic injury and then they feel as if like they need to rage, that they're justified in the rage and they will just sit up there and make all these fake accounts and be monitoring you and it's total violation to you. Hey, Ro, what's up, Jen Amber? How's it going? I went to the court to try to get a restraining order. Yeah, it's really hard to get a restraining order these days really hard to get a protection order to protective order and he hoovers oof how do i get over the final discard yeah so that the final discard is is peaceful for some people right it's freedom but you do have to go through some grief and that type of <clears throat> that type of final that end where it's over 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 is the the place where we get to heal, the place where we get to make moves for self-love and self-care, when we get to step into that new place of healing, right? So the final discard is basically a narcissist collapse. They don't hoover you back. They don't try to get into, you know, your psyche again and start fucking with you. And the reason why they do this is because they have a collapse. There's no more meat left on the dead carcass for them to feed off of. That means you did something right. That means that you didn't show them or give them any indication that you're still there to be manipulated. If you give them a little bit, you give them a tiny touch of energy, a drop of your energy, they will continue to try to hoover you back. They will continue to try to get you in and try to get you sucked in, hoover you back and suck you into the cycle of abuse. That's what they'll do. They want you to be in that supply closet forever. They want that so that they can discard you all over again. So if they stop and they don't go for it anymore, it's because you have nothing left for them to offer. You have, you're not giving them anything and that comes with no contact, that comes with total gray rock. So take it as a good thing. I know it feels really shitty sometimes, but you're going through the grief of that and that's totally okay. Hope you're doing good. Hey, Ben the Monster, hello my crush. Am I your crush? Am I still your Canadian crush? Sorry I don't come in when there's so many people on the live. I do Zoom calls all day. Oh, good for you. Are narcissists capable of real change? Well, it depends on what your definition of real change is. So, right. If a narcissist wants to change, they have to have some sort of realization that they are affecting people. There has to be some pain point. Yes, I'm still your crush. 
there has to be some sort of pain point there, right? They have to be able to, to look at their life and look at the people they've affected and take some self-reflection and go, wow, I've hurt this person, hurt that person. I was being inauthentic over here. I was being not myself. I was kind of being a shitty asshole. And they have to actually see that and feel that in order for them to change. Something here isn't right. I need to change. Just like an addict goes rock bottom and they want to change. Are they capable of it? Yes, every human being is capable of change. Every human being is capable of doing better. But they need to access the healing and the tools for themselves to do it. A narcissist doesn't have awareness. Most of them don't. It's pretty much unicorns that have self-awareness if they're a narcissist, right? So there's two self-aware narcissists that are dear friends of mine that are all together right now in Durham, North Carolina. I wish I was there. Um, but they are doing the work every day. So if you follow raw motivations and mental healness, both those guys are narcissists and they are both self-aware, meaning that they realize that they have a disorder that hurts and, and affects other people's lives. They've realized the impact that they've made on other people and they work every day to cope with their personality disorder. They work every day at it which means they go to therapy, they talk about it, right? They have to be vulnerable in the moment all the time, right? When did I realize that I was really, really done? There was a moment in my marriage where we would fight all the time. We would fight, 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 fight. And there was an, and tell me if this has ever resonated with you, if you've felt this, because it's a click, it's like a light switch goes off. So hands up if this story resonates with you. When I was with my ex-husband, he used to fight with me and tell me that I was sh like, you know, m that my body was disgusting. I need to work out. He would be like, no one's ever going to want you. You know, your, your body's gross now that you have three kids. Um, who's going to want a, a washed up, you know, mom, like single mom, like you're never going to find anyone else. Like no one's going to want you, right? Nobody wants you. And what's funny about that is like, yeah, you want me. You don't want me to leave you. You want me, right? Mike Marshall, right? So this is what he did to me. He devalued me, devalued me, devalued me, pushed all my buttons, not the good ones, right? He pushed all my buttons and made me feel like shit. And then I got super drunk. There's this one specific night I got super drunk and I set up a match.com. I was like, we're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. Right? You think I'm ugly. Why do you even want me? You fucking hate me. Why do you want me? So I'm like, we're done. I guess we're done. So I just went to sleep and I set up a match.com account because I didn't know how to do Tinder or any of those dating apps. I'm like, fuck that. Like, no one's going to want me. Yeah, right. I'm a hot piece of ass. Everyone's going to want me. So I set up this match.com account and I um, basically, he knocked me down to keep you, which makes zero sense. It's like totally backwards, right? Exactly. Mike. So he would, he would actually get so stressed out about money and then go to the casino and gamble it all away. That's how he would cope with his stress about scarcity was he'd go gamble all of it away. So it, it's a backwards thing. So he would knock me down just to keep me, right? He told me no one's going to want me. He says I'm a piece of shit, disgusting. My body's gross to look at. You know, your belly's all squishy and your, your ass is flat. Like nobody wants that. And so I'm like, okay. So I set up this dating line, this dating app. And I went to bed and I put separated on there. I woke up to like, I don't even know, 80 plus messages from men being like, hey, hey, let's meet, let's meet. And I was mortified. I actually was, I'm still a married woman at this point, right? So I'm like, holy shit, what did I do? So I just deleted the app, completely deleted my profile, deleted it completely. In eight hours that the app was live with my information on it, his best friend just happened to see me on there and told him, right? So he tells him, you know, your wife is on this app. Can you believe it? She says she's separated. Are you guys separated? What's up? And then he had this whole group chat with all of his boys being like, oh, I can't believe your wife is such a hoe. What is she doing? Blah, 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 right? You got answers to his questions, right? Um, and he was like, you know, basically he, he, woke me up in the middle of the night after a 32 hour shift. So I worked as a doula. I worked at home births, hospital births and birthing center births. And I would support and help women and their partners through childbirth and help them 
you know, hold their hand and do all the things and massages and all that sort of stuff when someone was giving birth. I went to a birth. I come home from that birth. Thank you. I got two, two out of 20 crowns, 18 crowns left to go. I come home from that birth at three in the morning, take a shower, go to sleep. He pulls the sheets off of me. Okay. Pulls the freaking sheets off of me. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on? What's going on? And I'm like, what is happening? Like, what, what are you? He's standing at the at end of the bed. Just standing there with dead eyes, like dead eyes, just standing there. So you're going to tell me? Are you going to tell me? And I'm like, tell you what? Like, what are you talking about? So scary, right? So scary. Were you going to tell me? And I'm like, tell you what? Like, I had deleted this app, not even thinking that in eight hours his friend would see it. I didn't think that I could ever, that I'd ever have to bring this up to him. Tell me how long you've been having an affair. And I'm like, what? Like, what are you even talking about? Like, I'm sleep deprived. I'm on going on 40 hours, no, 40, 50 hours, no sleep because I just worked a 32 hour shift and I'm trying to sleep and the kids have to get up in three hours. And he's like, tell me how long you've been having this affair. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So just out with it. Like, what are you trying to say to me? Say it right. And he's like, I know you were on match. I know that you put separated. I know you had a profile and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, listen, I'll tell you the honest truth. I set it up the other night when you told me that I was disgusting and that no man would ever want me. And I had to prove to myself that a man would want me. And it turns out 80 plus men do. So, you know, that's what happened. I was mortified and I turned it off. I deleted it. I'm not on it. I'm not having an affair. Oh, you're a hoe, you're a slut, you're this and you're that. And he kept calling me all these names and fought with me for three more hours until the kids had to get up. Wouldn't let me sleep. Wouldn't even give me the sheets back. I was just like, like, you know, just stuck at the top of the bed, like fighting, right? I'll hook him up with my ex-wife. They would be perfect. Oh my gosh, I know. Um, and so, yeah, like that would be, that was the, the sleep deprivation and that type of abuse that was happening. And I got up that day. I was crying, crying, crying. I wouldn't stop crying. And I was getting the lunches ready for the kids and the stuff for school. Thank you. We got uh, 17 left. So he was calling me a slut, a whore, a cheater, a liar, yelling at me in front of the kids. He was yelling at me in front of the carpet cleaners because the carpet cleaners had come over that day. And the carpet cleaners were like, is everything okay? Are we good to stay here? Like, should we leave? And he's just like, oh, it's just okay. My wife's a whore. My wife's a cheating, lying whore. Like he's saying this to the carpet cleaners. It was so uncomfortable, so uncomfortable. And I'm fucking crying, 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 right? Like crying, crying, crying. Our narcissistic ex dating app, create the profiles, right? So I'm crying and I'm just like trying to make the lunches and doing all this shit. He takes off, he dicks off somewhere. And I book an appointment to get my nails done by my girlfriend, Mia. And when he comes home, I leave. Hi, dreams. What's up? As I'm leaving, I get the dreaded phone call. And I see his name on my phone and I know what that phone call is. It's the apology phone call. Every time we had a big fight like this and we would, he would yell and scream at me and I would be crying all day. And he was like pissed. If I was crying, he'd be pissed. He'd be like, why the fuck are you crying? Like, sh- like, wipe your face. You're just so pathetic. He would say shit like that to me, right? And and I would get the, I got the phone call and I, I put it on the big speaker in the van. We had this minivan. And I'm like, hello. And he's like, hi, baby. Hey, honey. I just wanted to let you know that, um, <sighs> how are you feeling? How are you feeling about today? what are you doing? Where are you going? I'm like, I'm getting my nails done. He's like, yeah, you were, you were pretty upset today, huh? You were pretty upset today. 
And this is where the gaslighting really started to begin because I'm like, what the fuck are you trying to do to me right now, right? You're, you're, this is not a story. Whatever this is, is so inauthentic. It's bullshit. I'm seeing right through it, but I'm also fawning over it. Like I'm kind of needing that soothe because when a narcissist abuses us, they tend to be the one who soothes us. So we get this abuse and then soothe. So we get abused and then they put a band-aid on. So we need that Band-Aid sometimes, right? So I'm craving this Band-Aid from him. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. And then he goes, I just have to tell you something. And hopefully this will make you feel better. About eight months ago or so, I hired a, a prostitute. Right? And I'll say, out, out of respect for this, for sex workers, I'll, I'll say escorts. Um he tended to have escorts all the time. This is the first time hearing of it. I didn't know anything about this. Before we got married, yes, he had this run-in with escorts. He had another run-in. He was in the news because he got robbed by one. Um, and he just had a thing with them, right? So why did it be any different when we were married? It wasn't. He was clearly still seeing escorts, right? And that's where a lot of the, our money went to. I had financial abuse and everything like that. But a lot of it I thought was just gambling, drugs, and alcohol. I didn't realize it was also escorts. So he tells me for the very first time that he hired an escort. Eight months ago, I hired an escort, he says to me. And I didn't sleep with her, honey. I didn't. Because what she did was she robbed me. She robbed me. I paid $650 and the girl didn't even show up. She didn't even show up. So we got robbed, man. We got robbed. And like, yeah, it, it's a shitty thing that you did with the match.com and all that sort of stuff. But I do shitty things too. So don't feel so bad about what you did, okay? Okay, honey? This is how, this is how he talked to me. And I... I was on the phone and I immediately was like, that's, that's the light switch. Gotta go to bed. Love you. You're so brave. Thank you so much. I would say, I said to him, wow, like you don't know what you just lost. What? Huh? Cause I was already planning like an exit strategy with our therapist, but I wasn't like at the point yet where I felt ready to just like let things go. But that was the moment I took my rings off. That was the moment. And I said to him, I'm like, you know, when you were in jail, because he went to jail, like shortly after our wedding, um, when you were in jail, I had a, many good looking guys that I could have with, but that's the kind of loyal wife you have. This guy, this, this guy, we'll call him Adam. He was, he was very jealous of this Adam because he thought me and him had a thing. And he even confronted him one time and said, how come you were flirting with my wife and all of this sort of stuff? And Adam's like, I don't, I don't hook up with married women. That's not me. Me and Ro are just friends. And I said to him, Adam is so fucking hot. Okay, yes, he was in jail. I'm like, Adam is so hot. And I could have. When you were in jail, I could have. I could have, but I didn't. That's the fucking loyal bitch you have that you will never get again. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, this is over. This is done. This, this is an apology. You telling me that you hooked up, that you tried to hook up with a escort and you didn't get your way because they robbed you is your way of apologizing for all the shit that I had to put through today, being yelled at and screamed at and like belittled and berated in front of the carpet cleaners and our kids. This is the type of relationship that I'm trying to mend no it's over that's the moment I took the rings off that's the moment that I just said <clears throat> no and I said to him listen you are s I said Adam is hot <laughs> and I could have had him but that's not the kind of wife you married and you're never gonna find someone like me again because that's how fucking loyal I am to a piece of shit like you and you know what he said to me when I said that Take a guess what he said to me in reply to that. Take one guess. How did he respond to that? Right, a normal man would have had said, they were sorry you left, felt low about yourself and needed outside validation, right? Or taken some accountability for the fact that he told me that I was so ugly that I, no guy would ever want me, right? And just listen to the whole rest of my story, which was I had it. 
Good luck with Adam? No, he didn't even say that. This is what he said to me. I said to him, you have such a loyal wife right here. I will never, you will never find someone like me. Ever. Because the piece of shit that you are thinking that this kind of weird ass confession of having an escort eight years, eight months ago is some sort of weird apology for calling me all these names today and making me cry in front of all these people. That is your apology. And I'm sitting here being super loyal to you, knowing how hot this guy is. And I could have had something and I didn't because that's not me. He says to me, I knew it. All the times I asked you if you thought he was hot and you said there was nothing between you two. I knew there was something there. I knew it. You're such a liar. You're such a fucking liar. And I'm like, what? wow. I'm like, wow. Oh, my friends were right. We're in a group chat talking shit about you. We're all talking shit about you. Talking shit. They're like, so sorry that I had to marry some piece of shit like you. We're all in a group chat talking shit about you. If they didn't find you, then what? Then what, huh? You'd just be sitting around on your match.com getting all these dates. Then what? It's a good thing. It's a good thing my friend found you. And I'm like, your friends all have hit on me. Your friends are not ride or dies. You when you were in sobriety, when you had to when you were trying to get sober, all your friends took you out for drinks all the time, tempting you with the booze all the time. You don't have ride or dies. You don't have a good solid support system like I do. I'm going to get through this and you're not. And your friends that are sitting in a group chat calling me a whore and whatever else they're calling are going to be the very first ones who swipe right on me when they see me on a dating app when I'm single. Those are your friends. And he didn't have anything to say. I just, I just hung up, got my nails done. And my girlfriend Mia was like, where are your rings? I'm like, oh, they're in my pocket. I just took them off right now, literally right before I got here. And she's like, it's over. I'm like, it's over. That was the moment I mentally checked out. So this was a really roundabout and long ass story to whoever asked me, when was the moment I knew it was over? That was the moment. And I'm telling you right now, if anyone who's in it, if anyone who has this narcissistic relationship or who is in something toxic, and you're still stuck in this, like, should it work? Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't work. There will be a moment and it'll click for you. And you'll never forget that day. You will never forget that moment when you said, no, we're done. We're completely over. You'll never forget that moment. That was the moment for me. Mine would have said, well, what did you do to make them think it was okay to hit on you, right? They never take accountability. That moment is literally everything. It is, Chelsea. That moment is clarity. That moment is clarity. And sometimes in my coaching, when I work with you one-on-one, -on -one, I will help you find that moment. Sometimes something I say will click and it'll actually happen for you in real life right in your home. So if you're still stuck in this situation and you need to get that moment, you can do it. I think it's happened for me today. I feel nauseated thinking about him. Yeah, we start to shift from like, is he ever going to get better or is she ever going to get better to oh. <laughs> when you think of them, you're like, go away. I would never want to see you again, right? You don't see anything good in them. You don't see one thing good in them. And it sucks when they're the parent of your child, like your children. That part sucks. But you're also the parent. They're separate. You're, you're not co-parenting. There's no such thing as co-parenting with a narcissist or toxic person. Co-parenting means you're cooperating. People who are married and in loving relationships and live in the same house and sleep in the same bed are co-parenting. Because they're both two people parenting the same children, right? That means co-parenting. So two people parenting the same children, it means a teamwork. It's a partnership, whether you're split up or you're together. You can't co-parent with someone who is counter-parenting you all the time, who is constantly doing the opposite, who says, do this, do that, and then you do it and it's wrong, right? You want to put them in ballet and they want to put them in boxing. 
you want to pull them, you want to put them in this school, they want to pull them out and put them in that school. That's counter parenting. They're doing this specifically to exhaust you and to make you fucking crazy and drive you nuts because they're doing everything the opposite of you. So what you have to do is actually practice parallel parenting. It's like a French kiss. You know when it is over. <laughs> oh, I like that. You do know when a French kiss is over, or do you? Do you start hating the narcissist once you figure them out? I can't wait to leave him. Um, in harm reduction, when you're practicing that in your home and you haven't left them yet, I can help you with an exit strategy and leave this person. But if you're still stuck in the home and you are trying to figure out like how to cope around them, then you know feelings of hatred might come up, feelings of anger, feelings of confusion, all of those feelings come up. But knowing what it is and being able to identify it and cope with it can help with harm reduction and help you cope through living with them. Um, there's some really important things that I try to uh, tell my clients when I'm coaching with them too is that you don't want to get into this space where you're totally a different person. You want to kind of keep things as copacetic as possible in the relationship or in the household so that they don't know that something's up. You don't want them to fully know that you're leaving them. Because they could do one of two things. They could get really dangerous and you could be in a like a, a like a deeper need of of extra support and, and safety because they will get this injury that you're about to leave them and then they some people in some really abusive situations do not make it out. And the second thing they'll do is they'll be weirdly nice to you. Like really fucked up. Where you're like, why are you wanting to take me out on a date tonight? Or like, what, you cooked dinner? What's that? Like, they're weirdly nice to you because they're they're giving you this intermittent reward. They're giving you, and it's kind of, sometimes it's breadcrumbs, but sometimes it's the whole loaf. But they love bomb you all over again to try to keep you and suck you back in so that you can be back in the perpetual cycle of abuse. So you have to be really careful. If you start gray rocking too soon or too obviously, they might be like, whoa, something's up what's going on? Why is she acting like this? Or why is he doing that? Right. And then they'll just be like, they'll do one of those two tactics where they'll get really forceful and they'll get really ragey because they're pissed. They're like little kids that don't get their way or they're weirdly nice to try to get something out of you. And the nice is terrifying that, that it's so terrifying, babe. I know it's like, why are you acting like that? He used to, he used to do that to me. And, and I knew I kind of, now that I look back, I didn't know at the time, but now that I look back, I can figure out what that cycle was. I was like, okay, if I'm ready to leave and I start threatening to leave, then all of a sudden he's nice. And we go on a trip to Jamaica and then we come back and he's fucking like just abusive again. And it's back. And I'm like, okay, we're making this shit work. Okay. This is great. We're making it work. We're making it work. And then back to shit again. So they do this kind of cycle where they discard you, they devalue, they discard you, and then they hoover you back, love bomb you, abuse you, um, devalue you, discard you, hoover you back, love bomb you, abuse you, devalue you, discard you, hoover you back. And it just keeps going around in a perpetual cycle. It is the cycle of abuse. See, I'm an Aries. Well, I don't know what that means. How does that affect narcissistic abuse? I'm a Leo. So my birthday is, I think we've, I think we've entered Leo season. I think we just entered Leo season. Yeah, we have. Welcome to Leo season, everyone. You're a Libra and it's exactly like that for years. Yeah. Yeah, the cycle seems to get shorter and shorter each time. You know why? Because they get so lazy. They also can't stay in a nice state for too long. So whenever a narcissist is being really weirdly nice to you, you know, you have to remember this. I know it's really hard for people to, to grasp this. Who's had a narcissist act really nice to you? Hands up if you've had one. Thank you for the paper crane. We're looking for crowns. We're looking for crowns. If you want to give me a little crown, because there's a goal. There's a goal of 20 crowns. Literally you're driving you and saying niceness, right? Nice. Nice, 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 nice. When a narcissist is being nice to you, thank you. When a narcissist is being nice to you, they hate it. They absolutely hate it. It sucks for them because they have to put this mask on. And the thing is, it's so good. They look so real. 
they're like a real person. They're the person you wanted to be with, the person you fell for in the beginning. They put this mask on and it's exhausting for them to play this part. It's like getting up to go work a nine to five job that you hate. They do it, they're like, oh. but they put the mask on, they do it well, they hate it. Inside, they're really dying inside. They're like, oh, I don't wanna be this nice person. I'm really fucking crazy normally. They're like, oh, okay. Hey, honey, like, do you want a bottle of wine? Can I get you this? Can I get you that? Who you need a massage? Having a good day, bad day? Like, they do this nice bit where it's a bit and they put this mask on. And I'm telling you right now, they hate it. They're exhausted. And the minute they do it, they're resenting you. They're resenting you for having to play this part for you. They're like, oh, it's so much fucking energy being nice. It's just a distraction. They're doing it to distract you, but it's work for them. It's work for them. And the reason why the discard cycles get shorter and shorter and shorter is because they can't play that facade for too long. They can't. They hate it. They hate it, hate it, hate it. So when they do this, they're they're hating their life. It's like working that nine to five job that they don't want to be at. Oh, when is this over? When is the day going to end? Is it five o'clock yet? Oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this nice. They don't want to be that nice. So when the narcissist is weird, weirdly nice to you, the reason why you do get an ick feeling about it is because you know it's fake. There's a part of you who that knows it's fake. You're suspicious of it. And it's a weird feeling. Why do they buy you gifts and then expect praise and not just doing it from the heart? That it's a that's a great question. They're resentful. Okay, if they buy you a gift, they are expecting you to hold that and put that in the bank. What I mean by that is the favor bank. You know, when we talk about the favor banks, like I do something for you, you put it back for me. They can't do anything selflessly out of the kindness of their hearts. This doesn't work that way. Narcissists are very transactional. Everything you they do for you, you have to do something back for them. Always happens that way. Even something as simple as if I'm going to pick them up one hour early, or they, they're like, oh, I showed up 15 minutes early to pick up the kids. They expect you to take an extra day, right? It's emotional leverage, right? But it's also a tangible leverage. It's any kind of leverage. It has to be like an exchange. They can't just do anything. He, he, my ex used to negotiate all the time, every little thing that was going on. Okay, if I do this, then you got to do that. And like you took, okay, I paid this dinner bill. So like, how about we go to Banff and do this whole thing and you pay for it this time, right? Or the next time you get a deal, it's going to go to one of the bills I have to pay for. Like this is, this is what they do. Everything is transactional. They don't just do things out of the kindness of their own heart. They're always looking for something because exploitive behavior is one of the nine behavioral traits of a narcissist. They're exploitive. They need to be able to exploit a situation and benefit themselves. Mine says standard rates apply. You expect me to buy him everything. Yeah, so right, right, guys? suggestions for dealing with male narcissist boss that's a coaching session i can help you with that i have had clients that have had people in their workplace or their toxic work environments with either a toxic boss a narcissistic boss or a toxic employee or a co-worker that they work with if you do want help with that i can help you um, with some strategies and some things that we can do and maybe even an exit strategy for your work maybe this isn't the job for you Right. And I also have friends with career coaches that can help you find a career that is more suitable for you and that you feel more it's healthy for you. Um, but if you do want support in that, I do offer one on one coaching. I would book just go to the link in my bio under coaching and just book an appointment with me and it just follow the steps to book that appointment. But that would be coaching. Makes me sick to think of how much money I've sent on and spent on him for two years. Right. But they, this is part of the financial abuse. So financial abuse doesn't always have to mean that they're, um, you know, controlling your finances or telling you what you can spend your money on, right? Like they're not doing that. Hey, Ro, what's going on? It's Mermaid Batgirl. Hi. I know I haven't been live for a hot minute. 
I'll probably stick around for 90 for for the 90 minutes instead of an hour um, just because uh, we'll just we'll see how it goes I was only gonna do an hour but I still have half a glass of wine so I'll probably finish that sorry you're spamming hey no worries I can't see I haven't seen any spams thank you for the flowers we're doing crowns we're doing the little crowns I don't know if anyone can see I've got a goal four out of 20 I got 20 crowns to do you're in a horrible situation. I can help you. This is what I do. I'm here to help. I am a... Thank you. There it is. Um, how do you leave at a young age? You're 19. Yeah, emancipating from your parents is something that... Is it your parents that are abusive? Um, that is a coaching session. If you are able to book a session with me, I can help you come up with strategies. I also know people who have helped um, children people who are under 21 emancipate from their parents, right? Or do different strategies of harm reduction for at least two years to be able to do that. Oh, it's your girlfriend. Um, I would book a session with me, love, if you can, because everyone has such a unique situation and it's really hard for me to determine what it is. What I do as a life coach. So again, if you're new here and you're just popping in, my name is Ro. I'm a certified life coach and I deal with narcissistic abuse. So you can call me a narc abuse, abuse coach or whatever. But what I do is I help people with strategies to leave. I help people with um, helping them come up with ways to understand what this abuse is so that they can reduce harm in their home if they're still with the narcissist. If they're out of the narcissistic relationship, thank you, then I help them heal through it. Hey, lovely lady loves in the house. Hello, thank you for the roses. And I also help people recover from the trauma bond, ha have some tools to kind of step back into the world again. So if that means dating or um, just like finding your confidence and motivation back, finding your purpose in life and being able to remove some of that chaos that happens with clarity. We can only remove chaos when we have clarity, right? And so as a life coach, I listen to your exact story, exactly how it happened for you. I ask you the right questions to be able for you to feel comfortable sharing that with me, right? Life begins when we start asking the right questions. So I avoid questions that start with why. Why did I stay for so long? Why could a person do this to me? Why did this happen to me? Why didn't he do this? Why did they do that? The whys don't give us the solutions. They don't give us the answers. They get us nowhere. They get us nowhere. So what we need to do instead is ask the right questions. Life begins when we start asking the right questions. How I work with you in a coaching session is I start asking you the right questions and give you the space. I hold the space for you to share exactly what you're going through so that I can see it from a non-biased, loving perspective and give you my full assessment of the situation. The assessment of it, not judgment, assessment. Once I assess your situation, I can give you the tools and clarify it for you so that you can see it. You can see what I see. And I've seen it. I've been it. I've lived through it. That's my lived experience. But I also see it in all my clients. So I can give you really good tools on how to move forward with clear eyes, with this perspective, a clearing, right? I'm going to give you a clearing, a path so that you could see things with clarity. That's what I do. So if you do want to book with me and you want to get that coaching session, just go to the link in my bio and hit book a coaching session. And then I can help you with those tools. Amen. Bro will help you with no judgment. Yes, I will. Now I don't even care anymore. It happened and that's bad enough. Yeah, I always, I always say that one day with a narcissist is too long. It's hard when it's your daughter. I just can't move on. Yeah. This stuff isn't easy, guys. Healing from narcissistic abuse is not easy. And having community, there's three things that I think we all need in healing from narcissistic abuse. We all need three things. We need community. Having a group of people 
who are able to hear you from this place of healing, from this place of support, and who have lived your experience, who have lived something very similar to what you've lived, having that community can be really healing. The second thing we need to know is the education side of it, the knowledge, understanding what the terminology is. What is gaslighting? What is cognitive dissonance? You know, what happens when you collect euphoric recall? What happens when you are in CPTSD and you have certain things happening to you, like affects your sleep, psycho psychogenic tremors, having anxiety all the time, right? Exhaustion. These things, learning about these things and the narc education that you get from these videos, from these lives, um, from books that I recommend and YouTube videos from Dr. Romani, people like this, they're giving you the knowledge and the tools so that you're educated on this style of abuse because it's a style is what it is. It's not talked about a lot and there's, there's just not a lot of identification. This is why you're so confused in that relationship because you were hard to, it was so hard for you to identify what it actually was. And the third thing, and probably the absolute most important thing that we need to do and remember when we're healing from narcissistic abuse, community, education, and the third thing is self-love. Self-love, it's huge. Self-love is the key. And what do I say about love? Love is a verb. Love isn't just words. It's more than words. We don't just tell someone we love them. We show them we love them, right? It's the action. So what is the action to self-love? It's self-care. How do we practice self-care? I have some ideas. If you want to go to the link in my bio, you can download 31 ways to practice self-care under resources. I'm also talking a lot about self-love and self-care in our very first group coaching session, which is on the 31st of July. That is already sold out. But if you want to be in future coaching sessions where I will have 25 people sitting in a room and that one's going to sell out as well, there's another one coming up on August 28th and that one under events you can book. Now, unfortunately, the one next week is sold out, but you can go to the one in August. And I also do one-on-ones as well. So those three things, they're super important. Yes, actions matter, but patterns matter more. Yeah, I agree. If I turn this on, is it going to be too loud? Just let me know. Because it's so hot in here. Tell me if that's too loud. I just, I can't handle the heat right now. Oh, the zooms are great. How do I sound? Do I sound okay? You okay, babe? Thanks, babe. The narc says it's our patterns. Yeah, not loud at all. Okay, yay! It's so, it's so I need the air conditioning. Jay Rivero is up in the house. You sound good, love. Okay, good. It's fine. Okay, good. Whew, it feels nice. It feels nice. Hi. Jay Rivero if anyone doesn't know, he has been dropping some um, sponsored sessions for people who I give away uh, in a draw. I do a draw for sponsored coaching sessions periodically whenever somebody purchases one. If you ever want to, you can go to the link in my bio under sponsor a coaching session and, and be able to provide that gift to someone in need. Everyone who's ever booked with me under one of those sponsored sessions has needed it. I can confidently say that they've all needed it. And so anyone who does this, it's it's a gift to be able to do that for somebody. Um, does your ex try to contact you? He goes through my mom and tries to get through to my mom. And my mom's really kind and loving and knows exactly how to handle that. But I haven't talked. I've been no contact f for six months. Uh, December 18th was the last time we were in contact. So yeah, no emails, no nothing. He sent an email once to my lawyer that got to me and I ended up reading it. Um, and that was, that was really stressful. It's always stressful no matter how many years you've gone through. Thank you for the little guy. See, so if you guys subscribe to my live, you get access to these little emotes, which are super cool. How did I finally leave? So there was a moment of clarity, which I said earlier, I had this moment of clarity and it all came from a fight. And once I had that moment of clarity, I was able to take my rings off and leave. This was um, 
a planned exit strategy that I had with my therapist. And I just had this moment where I looked at him so differently. And it's like a light switch. It's like basically like, and then all of a sudden the light turned on and I was like, oh, this piece of shit. I don't want to be with him anymore. Right? You get out of the fog. Did I get, did, how did I get strong enough to leave? The strength comes from self care, self love, self awareness, understanding what narcissistic abuse is. All of that makes you stronger. No contact is what builds the muscle as well. Oh, Reason's in the house. Did I miss you? How's it going, Reason? Waiting for that moment. You will get that moment, I promise you. Self-acceptance, absolutely. Reason's in the house. A lot of me staying has to do with not wanting anyone else to have him. That is, that's, that takes some things to work through, for sure. A lot of people that I've met with that I have had um, on one-on-one -on -one coaching have had that same issue. You're not alone. You're not alone. Did I lighten my hair? I am um, no, I haven't in a in a minute. But I did go to Mexico, so I have this like tan going on, I think, and I think it makes my hair look lighter. I don't know. Do I have a Mexican glow? I feel like I have a Mexican glow right now. I know um, Mermaid has said I had a Mexican glow in one of my posts today. I heard love yourself the same way. You would someone you love. It made a lot of sense to me, yes. Totally makes sense, right? Christy, exactly. What's the hashtag we have, babe? That hashtag that you said? Just love yourself? Just do yourself. Just do yourself. That's what it is. Just do yourself. A glow about you, yes. Yep, I went to Mexico. I'm also in love. So there's that. I do have a Mexican glow. I'm tanned. Just do yourself, yeah. And you're happy. You glow when you're finally happy. Yeah, that's so true. Yes, revelation, an awakening. Just do yourself, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's important. It's important to love ourselves. It's important to express love to ourselves, right? Date yourself. Be in a relationship with yourself, right? When you can get to that place where you love yourself and you put yourself first, you know, you become this lighthouse. You become this bright, shining lighthouse with a light that is a clearing for the ships to roll in. All the goodness comes to you. All abundance comes to you when you learn to shine bright and you learn to live in gratitude, right? When we can practice gratitude every day and live from gratitude, abundance just, it is naturally in action. It just happens. Hey guys, Norma's in the house. What's up? Do I do one-on-one -on -one messages? I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and one-on-one -on -one text packages. So if you go to the link in my bio, if you go under coaching, you can book a 30 minute coaching session with me to get started. You can go down to resources and there's a package there, six flags, six day text packaging. And you can work with me and directly work with me one-on-one -on -one if you want to um, uh, have access to me via text. Why can't I just leave is not sold out, no. The one-on-one um, -on -one coaching that I, or the, the group coaching that I have next week is sold out, but why can't I just leave? You can go to the link in my bio under events and book that. It's gonna be an amazing webinar with Dr. Kristen Milstead. She wrote the book, Why Can't I Just Leave? Hosted by Carrie McAvoy, PhD, and with a couple of other amazing panelists like Abuse is Abuse, Bree Peterson, and um, SJ Ladisco Mama will be there moderating. I'll be there just as an attendee. So if anybody wants to book that, it's going to help you break free from the confusion or what we like to call cognitive dissonance, you know, having these thoughts that don't match, words that don't match actions, having someone say they love you but then also abuse you and being so confused with what that is. Our, our brains can't really handle two, two thoughts just like battling like that. So we pick the easy one. We pick, oh, they love me. Oh, they love me, but he also called me a piece of shit. They love me, well, but he cheated on me. So what the fuck is that? Like, you know, it's so confusing to be in that space. 
if you go to that link in my bio and you attend the webinar, this is gonna answer a lot of those questions for you, give you that clarity. So go sign up for that. If anybody wants to sign up for that right now, it's only $25. It's gonna give you access to the webinar recording forever. So you, if you can't make it and you wanna watch that webinar, right? But if you are able to make it to the webinar as well, you have an opportunity to ask questions. There will be a time for Q&A where you can ask Dr. Kristen Milstead everything you wanna ask about cognitive dissonance, about that confusion that we have in narcissistic relationships, about the pathological love relationships that we have with these people, right? So be, go to the link if you can right now and go register for it right now and come back and say, I registered. Come back and say, I'm in. You can, you don't even have to leave the live. You can go to that link, register, and then come back and say, I've done it. How do we purchase the text package and get a one-on-one? -on -one? Yes, so you can get a text package under resources. It's called Six Flags Tech Support Package. You can book that with me. You can get a one-on-one -on -one with me under coaching. So everything you can find in the link in my bio. Good night, you have to go to work. Have a good night. What did I miss? Cheating is the worst, yeah. Did you love my live with Carrie? Yeah, she's amazing. I was waiting for you to get back from Mexico to schedule again, yes. Yes, Christy. We stop avoiding ourselves trying to save everyone else. Should I send his staff by courier to him? I don't know what that means. I love her names for the, they're all roller coasters. So my 30 minute, my 30 minute like consult is Coney Island. It's the Coney Island um, cyclone. It's a, it's a, they're all, I think all of the roller coasters are in, in the States, I think. And then I have my Big Dipper, which is 60 minutes, uh, three packages is Scenic Railway, and five packages is the Wild One. And then my text package is Six Flags. And that's a six day text package. So you have access to me for six days. I find a lot of clients love this if they're on the go, or if they wanna just send me a quick voice note about what they're dealing with. I have a lot of clients that do this when they're in a court battle with a narcissist, or they're trying to they've had a moment where they feel like they might they might break no contact because the narcissist is kind of getting to them. So yeah, the names are pretty awesome. Yeah, they're all roller coasters and like theme parks. So yeah, the text package is a really great one to just, I know a lot of people are on the go. It's just easier to text. And I can, I can really clean things up for you quickly. As a life coach, that's kind of my goal. You, you have an issue, you're going through something, you want to process it send me a text. It's all starting to click in here. It's yep, yep, yep. Any other questions? I stayed on for a little longer than I wanted to. I was only gonna go on for an hour, but I think I'll stay on for 15 minutes and do a 90 minute live. Um, but let me know if anyone has any questions, again, my name is Ro. I am a certified life coach. I'm here to help you heal from narcissistic abuse. I want to share my story. And the biggest thing is so that you don't feel alone. I know how hard it is to deal with these people that abuse you in such a way that's not obvious. It's not obvious. You know, my ex never hit me. He never... And I know that there's a lot of people who have had this type of abuse, but he never hit me. So I didn't ever think it was abuse, right? Can you heal while still with an arc? Absolutely, you can always heal. You can always learn, you can always grow. That means you can always heal. How do you handle an attorney that is downplaying the abuse so you don't have control over that attorney? Anything, anytime you say, how do I handle this? You can't control what you can't control, right? You can only control your response to it. So being accepting that this person just doesn't get that this is an abusive thing, that this is an abusive situation, understanding that can be part of the healing. Why do narcs ghost? Ghosting hurts. You know, I don't know the answer to why do narcs ghost. I can tell you that there's probably a reason why anyone ghosts. And me personally, my take on ghosting is 
it is obviously it's painful it's obviously painful but there's no way for me to actually control somebody else just dipping out of my life whether they're abusive or not when someone decides to dip out of my life I have to deal with that with the grief of that and the loss and the change of plans or the change of routine if someone just dips out of my life like that there's a reason for it that I can't control or or that I just don't even yeah maybe we sometimes need an explanation but we don't always get it and I I wouldn't ask for it I feel like people ghost for their own reasons why a narcissist might do that is to get you to react because most of the time if they ghost they're going to be calling you again right if someone just disappears forever that's a true ghost what a narcissist does is maybe stonewall you or give you the silent treatment and disappear from you from time to time, but then hook you back and hoover you back and say, hey, I'm back. That's not really a ghost. That's just playing a game with you, right? Their reaction or they're busy with a new supply. Sometimes they're busy with a new supply and they'll only reach back out to you when their new supply doesn't give them what they need. And now you're the new toy. You're the new toy, all shiny and new again. You sat in the shelf for long enough and now it's time to pull you out and use you again. I am so glad you're here. I'm so glad I'm here and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I think ghosting is to avoid an uncomfortable conversation. It's it is awkward and it's also cowardly. I believe in that too. I believe all of that. I think that I think that ghosting is really an immature thing to do and I'm not saying that to be um, you know demeaning to anybody that does that I would never ghost because I think I feel like I'm in a I'm in a mature mindset I'm emotionally mature to be able to say hey this isn't working I'm no longer interested in you and this is the end of our interactions peace right I, I'm emotionally mature enough to say that to somebody without the fear of hurting them because this is for me. Unfortunately, if that hurts them, that's something that they will have to work through, not me, right? I don't take responsibility for creating pain. I understand that it can cause pain, but I'm not the one creating it. This is me telling my story and saying that I'm no longer interested in someone, right? But ghosting, the immaturity that it takes for someone to do that, they don't know how to have that conversation. They might not know how to say, hey, I'm not interested anymore and this interaction is over, we're done. They might not know how to do that or they might actually be scared of how that'll look and how the outcome will look on them. They may, they might be so protective of their image that they don't even want to ghost someone because they don't want them to think of them as a bad person, which is weird because when they ghost them, they're still a bad person in the other person's eyes, right? It's not being taught how to communicate, ghosting, yeah, yeah. Also, think of it this way, if you're putting yourself in the shoes of another, they might have had, you know, this awful rejection conversation with somebody where somebody said to them, I'm not interested in you anymore, you're not attractive or something about you and I just, I'm rejecting you. I'm here rejecting you, we're no longer together. And that rejection could have hurt them so deeply that they never wanted to be part of another rejection conversation ever again, even if they were the ones who caused it. Even if they were the ones who are like, okay, I'm rejecting you. Maybe they don't want to ever be in a part of a rejection conversation again. So they might feel like they're doing you a favor by not having the rejection conversation because they felt rejected by someone else and now they're not interested in you and now they want to reject you, but they don't want to. Do you know what I mean? So they'll just ghost you. Sometimes people think they're doing you a favor by ghosting you, by not having that uncomfortable conversation. So yeah, I think narcissists probably do it as a game plan, but people in general do it for a lot of reasons. Do you think sending a breakup text is appropriate as a final discard? I, what do you mean appropriate? Nothing is really appropriate with a narcissist. If a narcissist is giving you a breakup text, is it appropriate as a final discard? What do you mean? You're discarding a narcissist or 
the narcissist is giving you the text. Whatever you feel you need to do for your safety is right for you. If you need to do a breakup text, if you've given them fair warning to stop harming you and you just stop talking to them, then you then that's okay. But if you don't want to have a conversation with them because sitting down with them makes your stomach turn, then sure, do it over a text. Do whatever you feel is safe for you and that keeps you at the most lowest risk. Kind of disrespectful. Yeah, it just depends on the situation. It really just depends on the situation. The narc is sending the text. Oh yeah, that's, it, I mean, it's kind of a, either way it's a cop out. If the narc does it, if they're just like, peace, break up text. But if they're a narcissist, take that as a blessing. Take that as a good thing. I would love, I would love, I would have loved if this nine month relationship that I had with a narcissist who was very, I think he was probably a sociopath. He sent me most awkward voicemails that were really weird. And I have them on my other account that I'll probably pull onto this account at some point. Um, but if he would have just discarded me over a text and not called me multiple times from different numbers and not send me weird ass creepy voicemails and not call me when my best friend passed away and said some shit about it, like, I would have loved that. I would have loved a nonchalant breakup text and just him move the fuck on forever. I would have loved that. But I guess we shouldn't expect respect from a narcissist. No, we can't expect any respect from a narcissist. No respect at all. Hey, Ro, I hope you've been well. I have been. Crescent Moonbeam, what's up, girl? How come I'm not following this account? I thought I was following you. Now I am. Now I am. I was in Mexico. I was just in Mexico. The disrespect is the closure. I said that. Did I say that? Yeah, I said that. That's I'm going to put that on a t-shirt, right, babe? I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. Hi, JC. What's up? Yes, sir. I heard that today. Yeah, the disrespect is the closure. Thank you for the follow, Raw Dog Ron. <laughs> Raw Dog Ron, that's funny. Probably from Ro. I did say it. I think I said it in Dylan's live earlier. I'm pretty sure I said it and I said I was going to put it on a t shirt. If you have any superpower, what would you choose? Ooh, I love this. Um, why don't want I? Don't don't judge me, but mind control. I would definitely want to have mind control because I would manipulate for good. I would manipulate for good, honestly. I think therapists have. Uh, we all manipulate. Okay, manipulation is abuse, right? Manipulation is abuse but in the intention of harming another person to gain the benefit for yourself. That's when manipulation is abuse. But we all manipulate. All of us manipulate. We're all manipulative people. Some of us manipulate for good. Sometimes a therapist looks at you and goes, oh, if only, if only I could get through to you, if only you could see this, this one thing. I'm going to manipulate the situation so you can see it. They're doing it in benefit of their patient, of their client. Narcissists manipulate to only benefit themselves. So when I say that I want mind control as a superpower, it's because I want to manipulate for good, right? I want to be able to have people see it. I want to say, hey, can you see this? Okay, I'm going to just change. I'm going to control you a little bit, control your mind, and manipulate the situation so that you can win. I want you to win. All that I ever do as a life coach, whenever I'm working with a client and I make them see a hard truth, all I want them to do is win. That's what I want you to do. I want you to take your power back. I want you to feel strong again. I want you to be motivated. I want you to have confidence. I want you to walk into a situation with a narcissist and be like a fucking badass about it. That's what I want you to do. So I would want that as a superpower for sure. <laughs> Laugh out loud, my Jedi manipulator sister that's me what up i use truth yes 
It would be, yeah, it would be. Have you ever thought that you were, that I was a narcissist? That's how messed up he got me. Honestly, I never personally thought I was a narcissist, and I know a lot of people do. For some reason, I never really thought I was one. Um, but if you do think you're one, it's probably because they projected it onto you. Mind you, the abuse that I dealt with, with that narcissist, I didn't know about narcissism. I didn't know about any of that. He was diagnosed at the very end of our relationship. And even though he was, it didn't affect me in the same way. Like, she told me to read this book. Um, what was it called? I have it downstairs. It's called um, Will I Ever Be Rid of You? And it's, it's how to deal with divorcing a narcissist. She told me to read it, and I read it, and I was still even like, okay, he's a narcissist, whatever. I didn't really like think about it too deeply. And when I got out of the relationship and then started learning about narcissism and got on TikTok and all that stuff, it never occurred to me that I was one because I was so far away from that relationship that I never questioned if I was one. So the reactive abuse and all that stuff that I did that might have given me narcissistic fleas that I could have picked up was so far away it was like way in the past so I never really thought I was one but a lot of my clients think and ask me and I, I would say that this is probably the the number one question that I get asked in my coaching sessions is am I a narcissist Do you think I'm a narcissist and to that I always give you a one question test one question who's ready for it I got five minutes left on the live who's ready for this if you ever thought you were a narcissist or you want to know if you might be one, do you want to participate in this? Hands up if you're ready for it. Ready? Ready? Ready, ready, ready. Hands up if you want to know. Will, is that you in here, my friend? Hi. My Jedi narcissist. Okay, so here's the question. I'm going to give you a question and I'm going to figure out and and this is anecdotal okay so this isn't like don't quote me on it this is just something that I learned from a therapist if you think you're a narcissist here's the question and I want you to answer it really thoughtfully okay I've heard it never ask true or false <laughs> I've heard it said that a narcissist will never ask true or false so this is so this you're getting pretty close here will so here's it so here's the question the question is do you think you are a narcissist? And I'm going to give you the answer based on your answer to that question. So, do you think you are a narcissist? Yes, no, I don't know. Pop your question or your answer in the chat. Yes, you think you're a narcissist? Just write yes. No, you don't think you're a narcissist? That's a no and I don't know. Hard no, hard no, hard no. No, 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 no. No, no, and there's nothing right or wrong. Just tell me your answers. No, you don't think you're a narcissist. I don't know, very fair answer. No, I know I'm kind to hearted. I don't know, no, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, so a lot of I don't knows and a lot of knows. Nadoosh, what's up, girl? Sometimes, I don't know, right? No. Me, it was a for sure no. So I'm going to tell you, someone who is not a narcissist is going to answer no, might even answer yes, and is going to answer I don't know. Likely, if you were to answer any of those three questions, with yes, no, or I don't know, it takes self-reflection. There's a reason why you arrived at this answer. You arrived at this answer because you took some time to reflect back in the past and go, did I do some shady shit that makes me be a narcissist? Am I one, right? Did I do some shady shit and am I a narcissist? You look back at the relationship. You look back at the person you were with. You look back at the people you were with. Did I do some shady shit? Am I a narcissist? No. Did I do some shady shit? I had to reflect. Yes, maybe I am a narcissist. Did I do some shady shit? And that I had to reflect. I don't know. Right? The question is, do you think you're a narcissist? 
ultraviolet. The question is, do you think you're a narcissist? And if you answered yes, if you answered no, and if you answered I don't know, it means that you took self-reflection, you took a personal inventory of some of the shit you might have done to people that would lead you to believe that you might be a narcissist. Self-reflection is something that a narcissist doesn't want to do. They never want to do that shit. They don't want to self-reflect. This is how a narcissist would answer this question. Hey, do you think you're a narcissist? I'm going to tell you whether you th- you might be one by way by the way you answer this question. This is what a narcissist would say. What? You're not qualified to even ask me that. I'm not answering that stupid bullshit question. How would you know if I'm a narcissist by that stupid question? That's a dumbass question. I'm not answering that. Where's your license? Are you a registered therapist? Are you a clinician? Who gives you the right to even ask me that? I'm not fucking asking that question. No, I'm not answering that. That's a stupid question. And I'm not answering that. That is what a narcissist would do. So that that's your that is your key to knowing if you're a narcissist. Don't forget the deer in the headlight look, right? This is how my ex would look. Um uh, What? <laughs> You'd say, "What?" <laughs> right? They would show disgust, irritation almost immediately the second you ask that question. That is a question. That's fucking stupid. How are you even qualified to ask me that? Nin Nin, what's up, love? Honestly, they can say, I've seen you in that light. Ro, good job. Honestly, can say I've never seen you in that light. In this light? In this light? In my ring light? Thank you. Hello, gorgeous. Hello. I say when a narc asks to prove it and start saying a narc don't have right to ask me. Hmm? Yeah, they, they, they would, they would do that. It's the glow. I don't know what it is. It's the Mexican glow. I guess it's a Mexican glow about me. Apparently I have it. Apparently I've got a glow about me. I knew that I was dealing with a narcissist when I ended the conversation and walked away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, the face you made looked like a real narcissist because it was the face that the narcissist I married looked. He did this. What? How dare you even ask me that? Like, you're not qualified to even ask me that. That's what they would do. My ex screamed at me that I'm a narc, broken and toxic. Oof. Love you, sister. Love you guys. So yes, guys, if you want to book a session with me, go to the link tree in my bio under book a coaching session. Anyone who wants to purchase a coaching session for another survivor in this space that might be dealing with financial abuse, that might be dealing with isolation, not having the resources to book with someone like me and have the access to healing, you can book a coaching session for anyone in this space. Go to Sponsor a Survivor, it's the second link in my bio or the second link under the link tree in my bio and you can purchase it and what I do is I give it away for free to somebody in this space who needs it, okay? If you want to be part of my group coaching session, which the next one is going to be on August 28th because the July 31st one has already sold out, and they're, they're bound to sell out every month, honestly. Um, it's going to be a great event where we're all going to be able to talk in these Zoom, like it's a Zoom chat. So everyone's going to be able to talk and share their story. I'm going to facilitate it. So I'll tell you exactly what, you're, what you can share and say and what the topic is going to be that night. And we're all just going to chill and have it a, a place, a space to hold for everyone to heal. Um, that is group coaching. It's under events. Right underneath that link under events is Why Can't I Just Leave, which is a webinar hosted by Dr. Carrie McAvoy. She's a PhD and she is guesting and joining with Dr. Kristen Milstead who wrote the book, Why Can't I Just Leave? They're going to be talking all about narcissistic abuse, the confusion that we have in these relationships, 
talking about cognitive dissonance and how it affects the way we think about a relationship and having these compo- these opposing thoughts sort of battling each other. Hey, Art, what's up? So if you want to book that seat, that is going to be amazing too. What is the book your therapist told you to read? It's called, um, it's under books. So if you go to the link in my bio, it's under books. I believe it's called, um, Will I Be Rid of You? Will I Ever Be Rid of You? Um, it's about divorcing a narcissist, a high conflict divorce with a narcissist. So that is also in the link in my bio. If you want to take a peruse on the link tree in my bio and take a look at all of what I have to offer, all of my coaching sessions are there, all the events that I'm doing, um, the group coaching session, as well as my uh, affiliate link for why can't I just leave? And then you also have access to other resources. So if you want to do the trauma bond recovery course, which I totally recommend on recovering from a trauma bond, it's a 12 week self-guided online course that takes you 12 weeks to recover from a course or from a trauma bond. Plus the book that goes with it is under the workbooks and journals. So it's a a workbook recovery journal for trauma bond recovery. Yes, just block on everything. And Fiona, you booked your coaching session with me, right? So anybody who does want to have one of those coaching sessions and have their name entered in a draw for one can go to the link in my my profile and just hit the bell so that you have access to my lives every time I go live. So any will I ever be free of you? That's what it's called, Nadoosh. Thank you so much. Will I ever be free of you? Um, if you want to have access to the times that I'm live and be notified every time I'm live so that you know that I'm giving away a coaching session, as soon as somebody puts, um, that coaching session on my Calendly and, and books it and it shows up on my inbox, I usually just plan to go live and I give it away in a draw. I do a draw. We put your names in, I go for 20 minutes and we just enter it in. So if you want to win one of those and have an opportunity to have somebody else in this group pay for your healing session with me, then just hit the little bell in my profile so that you're notified every time I'm live. Better block on WhatsApp. Block on WhatsApp. I've also heard block on Venmo. Block on Cash App. Because they do weird shit. They send you money sometimes to get your attention. They do that. My ex would just withhold money to try to get my attention. Some people send you money. Then all of a sudden you're like on the hook and you're like, thank you for the $20. Like, you know, they do shit like that to try to get you to react. So if you can block them on every platform, every place, every social, I wish, right? I wish he'd send me money. I'd be like, fuck, I'll take the money. I never want to talk to you again. It's scary, right? So people are now blocking. I've had clients that are blocking on Venmo, blocking on Cash App, blocking on PayPal, blocking on all these places so that they can't have access to them at all. So that's something you can do as, as well. Um, and then lastly, guys, I have a healthy dating after abuse course that I have launched with Raw Motivations. Raw Motivations is a self-aware narcissist. His name is Ben Taylor. He has an app called the NARC app. If you go under resources, and this is free to download. So I know earlier I was like, everybody go register for, for why can't I just leave? You can still go do that. Go and do that. Go and link in my bio and do that. But if you want to just get the app, the downloadable app, which is called the NARC app, you can go right now and download it to your phone. And you can have access to Boundaries by Brie, which is a course that's created by Brie, Abuse is Abuse. It's all going to be about holding boundaries, keeping them firm, having consequences for the boundaries, what a boundary is and that it's for you and not the narcissist or anybody else. And then I also have a course on that app called Healthy Dating After Abuse. And that whole course is going to go through if you're ready to date how to know how to look for a narcissist, what a red flag is, right? Knowing what your love language is and your your type of attachment style is and doing this with a potential partner that you want to have a long-term relationship with. And then also like getting to this place of trusting yourself 
and what's next for you in this relationship and how relationship what it looks like as a healthy relationship that's called healthy dating after abuse if you want that go to the link in my bio download the narc app and then you can have access to that to that course so Thank you all for sticking around with me and chatting with me. I love you all. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Um, if I don't follow you back, you can go to my link tree in my bio and send me an email. And I will see you all around. Um, before we leave, why don't we take um, two minutes to tell me your freedom date. I got one sip. I got one sip of wine left here. So tell me, drop it in the chat. Mine is November 15, 2019. That was the day I left the narcissist. August 18th, 2021 was the day I went no contact. So whatever your freedom date looks like for you, even if you don't have it to the day, if you just want to write November 2020, November 2020, drop your freedom dates in the chat. A freedom date is whatever you feel you felt the most free. The date that you felt the most free. So freedom snaps for everybody who has a freedom date. 2018. Not yet. Still fighting. Okay. So girl lifted. Anyone who has not had a freedom date who doesn't have one yet and you're still fighting. Take a minute and look at these dates. Look at them. March. February. Okay. Okay. July 23rd, children cannot be narcissists. Well, children are narcissists, really. They cannot be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder because all children have this trait. They have all these traits because they're narcissists are just emotionally undeveloped. So children are emotionally undeveloped. So all children are narcissists, really. Um, March 2020. So what I was saying there, lifted, right? Was that your username, lifted? Lifted, if you don't have a freedom date yet, Look at these dates and use this as motivation. Use this as your purpose, your passion, and this is your inspiration. This is your sign. You are going to have a freedom date one day. You are going to have a freedom date one day. I promise you. Okay? Have hope. Hope stands for hold on pain ends. Have hope that you will be free from this pain that you will come into my chat one day and put your freedom date in here and we will celebrate with you, okay? We can celebrate your freedom. We're celebrating everyone's freedom. And you are the, this is your inspiration. This community is here to help you, okay? I can help you be free of the narcissist, but even just being in this space, even you being here right now is that it, it that's the trajectory for your freedom it is so much sweeter here on this side hold on pain ends that's what hope stands for okay i promise you that the worst day that you're gonna have the worst day on the side of freedom is still going to be far better than the best day with that narcissist my worst day on the side of freedom was sitting in an icu with a vent in my throat dying from COVID and feeling like this was the end. That was the worst day. That day was still better than like my wedding day. Your worst day on the side of freedom will always be far better than the best day with that narcissist. Okay. So even if you're depressed, even if you're anxious, even if you're going through all that, it's still better. It's still sipping on champagne on this side and eating shit on that side. So one day you'll be on this side. I promise you. And when that happens, you can be in this chat telling me what your freedom date is and telling me how amazing your freedom is. Okay? So thank you guys so much. Somebody said they need advice. And uh, NY, I got you. You can send me an email anytime. Go to the link tree in my bio if we're not mutuals. Go to the link tree in my bio under send me an email and just send me a quick email. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Happy freedom to everyone who's free. Sorry I went through that. Thank you so much, Art. I, I'm obviously good now, so I'm really good. Um, I love you all. Stay narc free. Bye, guys. <laughs>